Welcome to Kibbe on Liberty. We're talking to Lawson Bader. Mother Jones calls him the dark money ATM. But in fact, this whole debate about donor advised funds and donor privacy is essential to the freedom movement. It's essential to America. And by the way, we're going to drink some whiskey. Check it out. So, welcome Lawson Bader. Uh, Almost nobody knows who you are, but they need to know because I've been doing opposition research. (laughs) Um, You don't know this, but I I used to be a guy that did opposition research for Lee Atwater at the Republican National Committee. This is not boding well for me. So I know how to dig the dirt. Okay, Um, I can take the dirt. But but tell, tell tell us who you are before we start ripping you apart. All right, well, I'm Lawson Bader, and I'm not sure I want to say anything more about that since clearly- (laughs) you want to take uh, the fifth? Yeah, I think I'll take the fifth and every other constitutional amendment that I can. Uh, Lawson Bader, I I run an organization called Donors Trust, uh, which probably most people have not heard of, or at least have not heard of directly. And what is is Donors Trust? Donors Trust is a uh, 501c3 public charity that operates a donor advised fund. Yeah. Donor advised fund is the operating word. So we've uh, we've added whiskey to the mix because the idea of talking for forty minutes about the tax implications of a donor advised fund not terribly I, stimulating. I, I would I would need booze for that. Yes, how but do you as, think as, I begin my morning? Yes, well, it's I mean whiskey is is really for breakfast in my mind, especially the chewable type. Um, but the uh, I'm not joking. I, I googled you, and and I was very disturbed, <laughs> very disturbed. <laughs> And I, I want to read a headline so that people understand why donor advised funds matter. This is a this is a flaming political football. I just made up that metaphor. I don't you know, did. know what that it's is. It's an image. I'm not sure about. But the, uh, one of my favorite publications, which I'm looking at right now, I sort of feel bad giving them the click. But Mother Jones has written a story about you guys. Can we pour now? Or <laughs> okay. Um, exposed the dark money ATM of the conservative movement. You haven't heard of Donors Trust, but it's bankrolling the rights fight against unions, public schools, climate scientists, and more. So we've established that you don't like workers, you don't like students, and you really don't like the environment. But but let's let's have some whiskey. But let's have some whiskey. <laughs> um, so um, I, I I pulled this off my shelf. Um, I recall from uh, previous uh, times that we may have possibly drank whiskey together that you like PD. Big boy whiskeys. Is that I a true do. fact? I like peaty big boy whiskey that, as my wife says, you peel off the ground, you add some water, you mix it up, and you swallow it. And this is this is like uh, uh, genetically ingrained in you because because you come from the old country. I come from the old country. It's where the Lawson family is all about that. My great grandparents moved from Scotland. My great grandfather, you'd love this, used to be the bailiff of Multnomah County in Oregon and he used to wear his kilt. And uh, they tried to fire him when he got too old. He sued for age discrimination. He won. He continued to wear his kilt till he was something like 78 or 80 years old. And what finally did him in was the judge made some ruling. And my great-grandfather stood up, pulled his skin dew out of his sock, looked at the judge, and just goes, you cannot do that. <laughs> and that more or less ended his career as a uh, legal officer of the court. But, uh, yeah, so it, uh, it, it flows in, uh, in my body. My, uh, my grandmother talked about uh, living to 105 because it uh, allowed her to get pickled every day. So pickling's an important part of my life. Pickling. So I, I, I sort of expected you. Did that pop really well? Yeah, that was pickling. Good. Yeah. <laughs> We're, I'm trying to learn how to mo- not make the mic pop mm-hmm. when I talk, which, which most things I try to do are really hard for me. Mm-hmm. No but, uh, you know, the Scots are, are fighters, so I sort of expected you to come in um, with your face painted blue, screaming freedom, but that's where the Scotch comes in. That's where the Scotch comes in. Do you remember the uh, Prince of Thieves, the movie with Kevin Costner and the yeah, Robin yeah. Hood, and uh, halfway through, the Prince John or whoever the, the, the dead English king now is, uh, decides to uh, send his emissaries up to the north to try to uh, rob uh, everybody of Sherbet Forest's finest. And the scene cuts to these crazy-looking people in blue face and 
wearing things they probably shouldn't be wearing. Creeping through the woods, <clears throat> my wife turns to me and she says, you know, those are your people. <laughs> and I embrace that. So, yes, we that's, uh, that's your fighting family. and drinking. That's, that's your that's family. That's the family. Exactly. So, so you didn't know I was going to do this, but uh, I went up to the vault here mm -hmm. and found a Laphroaig uh, that's been finished in sherry casks, which, which I find takes a little bit. Takes the edge off. Of, of the burn off mm -hmm. of this particular whiskey. But uh, the roadkill is only half halfway effective. Yeah. That way. But you're, but you're an Isla whiskey guy, right? I am. Tell, tell us, now, can tell you spell why. Isla? Come on. Come on. You know, Matt, I, you're on, I you're on record here. I can probably spell it better than I can say it because I still say Isla. Isla. Um, I love. What is it? I, Isla. Isla. I -L -A. I -S -L -A -Y. Yeah, see, I can't even it spell it. It makes no sense. M many things in Scotland don't make sense. So the first lesson mm -hmm. is, is how to say Isla. Which is which is the the island known for insanely peaty, smoky, which now is the, I would call the holy grail of uh, of Scottish malt whiskeys. So here we go. Mm -hmm. Boy, ah, there you go. You can just see it on that yellow dot in the lane. But I chose this one specifically because uh, a couple years before he died, my dad went to Scotland and, and fell in love with Laphroaig. He had always mm -hmm. been a proper martini guy, given given his British heritage. I don't, I don't want to change, start right? a fight. That's all right. Well, call me English. You know, they, after, after thousands of years of fighting, it turns out that, that whiskey is what brought us together. As, a, as, a, as competing clans, mm -hmm. but uh, he, he was into Laphroaig and, and I've tried to get it, Yeah, but it's, it's intensely, it, it's got this iodine finish. That, it is probably the, one of the more, more iodine focused whiskeys, yeah. especially on the island. So you are not alone in that observation. But the sherry cast seems to take a little bit of the edge off. Mm -hmm. um, I've done a lot on beer, mm -hmm. as you may know. Beer is freedom. Beer is freedom. And beer Although is... Although whiskey and freedom go together, said Robbie Burns. Yeah. Well, I... The, actually, the the entire history of whiskey, literally from day one, was a fight over government control, mm -hmm. and it's because it really sort of originated almost as a currency. It was mm -hmm. a, it was a store of value I at a time when when you couldn't necessarily trust uh, the government, correct, and money, that kind of thing. But but I'm going to say something controversial. I understand that it was the Irish, and not the scots ah when is this interview over <laughs> i don't know if that's true or not do you dispute that claim? of course i dispute that <clears throat> however the irish and the scots do share one commonality which is the english yeah so uh if i was to be intellectually honest which i will try to be um the irish uh, there's certainly a celtic impression that comes from both places more people would say that single malt originated in scotland than ireland than ireland but Speaking of Isla, you can stand on the southern shore of Isla and you actually can see Northern Ireland in the distance. So the reality is there's a lot of trade and commerce, yeah. which is, again, part of the story of whiskey. So yeah. I will play a, 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 a high position here and say it could be Irish or Scottish, but I mean, of course it's Scottish, but yeah, of course. But anyway. Now, I didn't know this till this morning, but uh, the, the word moonshine comes supposedly, this is according to Wikipedia, which okay. is, is usually right. Especially about everything. Um, the word moonshine comes from the Scottish reaction to English attempts to tax the crap out of whiskey. Right. And, and or it, make it illegal, yeah. actually. Um, make it illegal but or tax it out of existence. It's all this, this iterations mm -hmm. of this. And the, the Scots had a very different reaction from the Irish. Um, they started distilling at night. So you couldn't see the smoke couldn't coming the out smoke. of the stills, which is according to Wikipedia, is where the word moonshine comes from. You know, I actually did not know that. So yeah. I have been kibby educated. Yeah. So you can't, you can't stop whiskey. You cannot stop whiskey. And you can't stop freedom. And, and the, the, the entire history of, of whiskey is a, is a story about uh, human ingenuity and creativity against the deep arm of the state. Sure. I would even say it's, it's, it's absolutely that. But if you think about it, you know, I think about whiskey as being the human spirit. It's yeah. not just the taste is fantastic. The, the social uh, ambiance is obviously important. But, you know, the history of whiskey is tradition. Um, you know, the distillation process is a pretty basic one. I mean, you've got wood, heat, barley, fire. It's pretty much it. It's, it hasn't changed much, but it's also 
evolution and migration. So distillation and alchemy was kind of discovered in the Middle East. So where did the Middle East go? Eventually they came into southern Spain. They met, they met up with the monks who were brewing. All of a sudden you realize, hey, uh, you know, wheat has a little different taste when you just do a distillation, not just uh, brewing it for beer. Then you head over the Northern Islands where wheat doesn't grow that well in Scotland, but barley does. They discover a whole new idea. It heads the new world. They discover corn. Corn has a whole different component. It's this wonderful migratory pattern, but it's also all the experiments and, and it shows you the importance of accidents, as yeah. we know in, in innovation. So when you're trying to, uh, you got to put it somewhere, you find a barrel. The barrel has a bunch of fish in it. Probably not a good combination. So what do you do? You burn the barrel. All of a sudden you discover charred wood does something to the flavor. Or if you've got a distill in the middle of the night and you got to hide it somewhere, you stick it on a mule in a small little barrel and you discover two months later that being in a barrel for two months actually changes the color, changes the composition. So it's this wonderful discovery process. And you're right. It's the whole history of the citizen against the state. Um, and that's the story of us, which I think is what makes it such a powerful uh, tool. Yeah, so so officially right now we are launching a new, um, very empirically focused series on whiskey is freedom. Okay. Because I, I think it's got to be, it, this it has to be delved into. Um, but, you know, the, that whole process, and I, I watched the, the current debate about cultural appropriation. Mm -hmm. And as, as someone that, that loves the sort of mutation and, and I call it stealing. There's, there's ideas that are stolen from, from our fathers and our grandfathers and, and from people we never met, but, but they had ideas that were borrowed as well. Um, that's the bottom-up process of, right. of market discovery. And you know we wouldn't have whiskey if there wasn't all sorts mm -hmm. of cultural appropriation. Mm -hmm. We can have a fun argument about whether or not it was the Irish or the Scots, sure. but... It kind of doesn't, doesn't really matter. matter. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. It was all of the above. But I think it's important to say... What's the real reason why George Washington stepped down as president of the United States? It might have been because he had this appropriate sense that he should not be a king and in perpetuity. That's a good thing. But the reality was he was the largest whiskey maker in the United States. Part of it was going back to Mount Vernon so he could return to his love, which was making whiskey. I mean, he had that whole problem of the whiskey rebellion thing. We'll sort of let that one go. But, but, um, no, I'm not letting it go. Okay. You can no. let it go. It's Kentucky anyway. No, I, yeah, honestly, uh, um, I feel like the United States lost its footing that day. That day? That, that day was it? Of, the, of the Whiskey Rebellion when George Washington and Alexander Hamilton put the big foot of government down on, on distillers. I, I think it started in Pennsylvania. I, I think he was just a crony capitalist was, at the end of the uh, day. Yeah, he was a big distiller. I so mean, we got to be honest here. here. Yep, exactly. Um, it even affects George. So uh, if we can talk smack about George Washington, I feel like everything's every, everything's on the table. Um. And we're on this side of the river, so we're okay. But yeah. when, when I go home, I may be in hostile territory. Though. Oh, yeah. But notice my strategy here. Mm -hmm. I got you a little liquored up. Yep. And now I'm going back to Mother Jones. Now you're going back to Mother Jones. <laughs> um, <laughs> this, um, this, this question, I mean, and this, and, you know, I'm, jo I'm joking around because I, I think it's fascinating how um, uh, apparatchiks on the left will take a, um, a, a, a tax philanthropic giving strategy it goes back to the 1930s and has been very much um, used and employed by the left through the Tides Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, and suddenly, um, your founder, Whitney Ball, mm -hmm. said, uh, discovered, what, what year were you guys started? Nah, 1999. 1999. 20 years ago. And, and I think her idea was, um, they're doing it, we, sh we need to do it too. Exactly right. Um, but now it's now it's a dark money ATM. Now it's a dark money ATM. Um, but... But I think uh, I think I think it's important people to understand. You and I both do lots of speaking internationally, and one of the first things you hear about when you look when you talk to these startup groups is that there is no tradition in almost any other country of, of philanthropic support mm -hmm. and charity and supporting uh, philosophical causes and and sort of the the ideas that might make for for a better, more prosperous society. Um, it's an American thing, right? By design. Yeah, there are, I mean, you're right. I sometimes smirk at the whole dark money ATM thing, but the reality is it's, it's not a term of endearment and it is mostly, it is entirely a term of intimidation yeah. um, by design. Um, and we can talk about sort of the origins of that. In fact, uh, Kim, Kim Strassel has a great book called The Intimidation Game, which talks about the origins of this use of the dark money term going back to Citizens United 2010, and that's all fine. But 
the real concern, the real reason why it's a problem, I think on one hand, it's a practical issue. It's an intentional effort by those with whom you might disagree ideologically to literally reduce sources of income to groups with which they, they, they're opposed. Uh, and so while the right hand's trying to deal with disclo disclosure rules and uh, litigation and whatnot, the, the groups on the left are actually passing the rules and the laws that otherwise we might argue. So it's a distraction issue to sort of the messenger, not the message. But sort of one level up is it's a big problem when it comes to the idea of transparency and privacy. I think people forget that in this country, citizens have privacy government has transparency. That, that's how it works. You elect a politician, kind of gives us the right to put a camera in City Hall, gives us the right to look at their work emails, not their personal emails, their work emails. Uh, we can look at their budgets and how they spend money, but it does not give them the right to do the exact same thing to us. But again, you sort of move one level up even more. It's a, now you've got a political free speech issue. People forget that we could make the argument that the Constitution of the United States would not exist without anonymous private speech. No Federalist Papers that, that set the debate. That was written anonymously. Um, so it's that issue. But the real crux of the matter, and you hinted at it, is um, fundamentally if we get caught up in this whole dark money language, um, it alters the relationship between the, city, uh, between the, the citizen and the state. Um, our country, by design, was set up with the founding documents to put a metaphorical wall around government to allow citizens to use their time, treasure, and talent to address problems that they see. We start changing that, then the whole system changes. Yeah, and it, it, it's, um, it's a source of uh, liberty to speak your mind mm -hmm. against very powerful interests, uh, probably, perhaps, sometimes in cahoots with government, sometimes trying to game the, the outcomes of what government does. And, and in some ways, I sort of uh, uh, deeply respect the way that the progressive left is very entrepreneurial about this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and I was, as, as you know, I was a Tea Party organizer working for a large nonprofit um, during the um, IRS Inquisition. Mm -hmm. And it was an Inquisition. It was an Inquisition. It was, it was a wicked abuse of government power um, because all of these citizens who were trying to follow the rules, right. as complex as they were, um, as as impossible to comply with as they were, um, they all thought that the, the system was fair enough that if they wanted to petition their government for a, a redress of grievances, they would they would follow the paperwork. Mm -hmm. And and all they'd managed to do was make themselves targets. Um, but that process, it, figuring out why, why would the left be going after 501c4s, which was the primary target of the IRS, um, and I suppose we should go back and define all these things, but... The reason they were doing it is because they had evolved mm -hmm. and, and they had come up with new business structures and, and new tax strategies that, that really didn't depend on 501c4s anymore. So, so let's unleash the dogs That's right. on 501c4s. Well, and you've also got to remember the context of that. So up until 2010, when Citizens United passed, you had a very unpopular Dodd-Frank bill passing. You had the bailout going on. You had Obamacare. And all of a sudden, the Supreme Court comes along and says, hmm, looks like some groups might be able to organize in an activist way, in an appropriate legal way. And all of a sudden, the White House is faced with immense opposition to what have been unpopular um, issues. Even if Republicans passed them, they were still unpopular. And so the hounds sort of were unleashed. Yeah. Um, and this national frogging at the mouth campaign sort of began. And that's when you saw the lowest learner issues. It's when the dark money phrase actually sort of emerged by... The unsaid magazine that I shall not mention. Um, and uh, by the way, they've said far worse things about far me worse. than yeah, they've I, said about I, you. Yes, I have no doubt about that. But um, it is what <laughs> it is. So you, yeah, you began to see all this activity. Um, in fact, Media Matters uh, released uh, or leaked a playbook that they had, which said very explicitly, "We're going to go after the donors in this. We're going to make giving actually be sort of the." Uh, the embarrassment, and therefore we see restriction of funds. People forget that Brendan Eich, who was the founder of Mozilla during this time, essentially was forced out because it was disclosed that he had given something like a thousand bucks five years previously to the Proposition 8 campaign in California, which I think was one of the gay marriage things. And all of a sudden, he's fired yeah. as the head of Mozilla. Yeah. That, that, that's the context of this. And unfortunately, given today's sort of lack of civic conversation, we're just seeing that manifest itself in a lot more it's ways. Like, it's uh, it's Saul Alinsky 101. You can, you can keep going back to that book 
which which unfortunately I've read many times. And and his he's he's about ridicule. He's about isolating the mm-hmm. enemy. And if you single out somebody that's that's trying to participate in the process, you can make it so that they just don't want to do it anymore. Right. Um, which which I think is fundamentally anti democratic. <laughs> like I I actually believe. Um, I believe in democracy. I'm one of these naive guys that thought that organizing people based on a common set of values was 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 a was a, a fundamentally American thing. And sometimes the left agrees with me. They're talking mm-hmm. a lot about liberal democracy now, which by by which I think they mean something that we they mean might, something different. Yeah, it might it might mean sort of like what we mean by rule of law, right. maybe. Um, but that's a phrase you know, that can some, get mistwisted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. So I, I wonder, you know, it, it seems it, go back to the the phrase apparatchik, like mm-hmm. you know, these are these these things aren't values that they share; they're opportunities to right. to, to hurt the enemy. Well, your key phrase there was also uh, sort of democracy, because I spend a lot of time now having to sort of defend this, and, and less defending than just promoting the idea of philanthropy. But Stephen Carter, is a Yale University professor, talks about philanthropy being essentially the great democratizer. Um, of of the country, and the reality is, there's this, always this understanding that ah, oh, you're a philanthropist. Well, that's an Andrew Carnegie, that's a Ford. We're talking billionaires. No, the reality is, if you're a charitable person, you're a philanthropist. Right. Donor advised funds, in particular, the the, the ability to give means anybody can partic- any citizen can participate in this world of philanthropy. It's a really important source of independent power. It's not just something for the elites. And the irony is, there's something like. Uh, you know, $125 billion of philanthropic capital in private foundations and organizations that very strongly lean sort of in a progressive way. There's about $10 billion of groups that sort of lean to the right. Um, the irony is it's actually easier for people to participate in that $10 billion than it is that $120 billion, whatever it is. So in a way, those who are sort of on the right are actually democratizing philanthropy at much greater lengths than sort of these elites that are on the other side. But Again, we lose that ability to participate philanthropically. We've just changed the nature of, of the citizen of the state in a very bad way. Yeah. The, um, let's, let's take a step back because now we're getting into sort of the, the nitty-gritty of, yeah. of these structures. Which means I need to sip. Um, yes. Yeah, please sip because right. um, every time we say donor-advised fund, you have to chug. So. Okay. All right. Better than that than um, dark money. But you, know, you, you, mentioned, you mentioned politics and I mentioned 501c4s, mm-hmm. but... But what you're talking about here is something fundamentally different. So, yes. so, so walk us through C three, C fours, sure. politics. Yeah, there are there are the IRS tax code. Wow, I never thought I'd actually say that phrase. See what this is already doing to me? I'm <laughs> quoting the IRS. Um, there are five hundred one. The C section of the five hundred one determines sort of public uh, charities. There's multiple classifications. The most common classification is the C three, which is your your religious, scientific, um, arts, culture. So the church, the synagogue, the, the Boy Scouts, Red Cross, that sort of thing. C4s are actors that are explicitly engaged in political advocacy. Now, a 501c3 charity can be political in the sense that it can have uh, a basis of belief. It can issue, for example, a voter guide. It's not telling you how to vote. It's just saying here's what the issue is, A or B. Um, it can express uh, policy solutions without send, telling somebody to vote specifically. So that's the key distinction. And, and that's actually been the problem is there's a lot more transparency rules on the C4 side of things. There already is pretty much a lot of disclosure as to who supports that, but there's not on the C3 side. And it's this attempt to take those disclosure laws and now apply them uniformly to the C3 world. And so now you have a situation where you know, the NRA and Planned Parenthood's donor list is now supposed to be made public to the world. And now we're talking a privacy issue, yeah. um, which is a different, a different piece. But it is an attempt to thwart really the marketplace of ideas. And 501c3s are idea organizations or the relief organizations. They're doing the work intentionally that government wants them to do because they don't have the time or resources to do so. So again, we're back to shifting the whole, uh, the whole relationship. Yeah, so it, the uh, when I was researching my last book, I happened to be writing the the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King's "I Have a Dream" speech. Mm-hmm. So I, I stopped everything I was doing, uh, watched the speech, which I had never watched the whole thing, and then started doing a, a deep dive. 
and and discovering all the things that the government, the federal government, mm-hmm. state governments did to intimidate civil rights leaders to target them, and you know uh, Hoover infamously, with uh, Robert Kennedy's blessing, went after uh, MLK's yep. nonprofit, um, and that's really where this 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 privacy test comes from. Right. It, it it was determined to be an essential uh, protection of our liberties. Give me a little bit of that history of the Alabama case. Yeah, there are there are two Supreme Court cases that are fundamental to any conversation we have about donor privacy and the importance of keeping a wall between citizens being active in their community and government doing it. The first was a case involving Dartmouth College in, in the 1820s. Ironically, Thomas Jefferson, who I think was taking the wrong position on that. And that was very important. What? Setting. Yeah, Thomas Jefferson, the guy who wrote the Declaration Saint of Independence. Thomas Jefferson? Saint Thomas Jefferson actually came up with a scheme to fire the trustees of Dartmouth College because he differed with them politically. And his reasoning was philanthropic because Dartmouth College was a private school raised with private money but served a public purpose. Therefore, any private gift that serves a public purpose could be under the control of the government. That was his argument. Yeah. He lost, thank goodness. So that established that wall. Fast forward to 1950s. So the NAACP, a rather important organization in the history of civil rights, wants to go down to Alabama. As often is the case, states require organizations to register with them to sort of conduct business. It's a fairly straightforward thing. In Alabama's case, they said, if you want to come down here and do some work, we need your list of donors. Well, and trust us. We'll, and trust us. We're, we're not going to do anything not, with it. It's just uh, yeah. you know we're just making sure you're a legitimate organization. Really? We're from the government. We're, we're from cool. the government. Yeah. We're here to help. Well, obviously the NAACP refused, and it went a very quickly to the Supreme Court. And in a nine-zero decision, it was one of the faster decisions that came out of the court. They made it quite clear, uh, both reverting back to that Dartmouth case and a few others, that not only is there a separation between the sort of the private and the public, but there is absolutely an inherent right. Um, of the private citizen to engage in causes that he or she deems appropriate, particularly in the 501c3 world, which the NAACP was. And so it's fair to say without donor privacy, we wouldn't have the civil rights movement um, today. And, And that has just manifested itself in all kinds of causes, even ones that you and I disagree with. People should have the freedom to sort of put their money where their mouth is, and that's a good thing. I feel like it's, it's a blessing and a curse for our side. And I'm, I'm, I'm a libertarian, classical, liberal, mm-hmm. constitutional conservative. I'll, I'll accept all of those labels because... I just like whiskey. Yeah, I, I, I drink whiskey. That's, that's, a good, that's a good ideology as well. Um, you know, we, we try. I mean, and I'm not, I'm not talking about politics or the Republican Party, but I'm talking about this, this philosophical umbrella that, that we live under. We, we try to be consistent. Mm-hmm. which is why we talk about the rule of law, mm-hmm. to, to which us means uh, treating everybody just like everybody else. No favors, no, I don't care who your parents know in right. Washington. We're going to treat everybody like everyone else. So when we talk about these rules of protecting privacy, it applies to our worst enemy. Mm-hmm. And and that the, 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 I'm not sure the other side thinks that way. No, it's been interesting because I've been involved in a couple of coalitions trying to do exactly that, which is to make the case that, look, if, this, if, if, if we are getting harassed because of this, it's only inevitable that you will too, since we're both arguing from a principled standpoint. And uh, especially among the environmental groups, they've had a harder time. They're, they're sympathetic, yeah. but they've had a harder time to sort of disengaging with the perception of who they are. We've had some success with Planned Parenthood. It's like, look, we do not want Planned Parenthood's donors to be nailed to a wall somewhere. Bad things have happened. Bad things will happen. Um, and so we're starting to get some of these alliances. Unfortunately, the sort of the, the, the commentary that we see right now in the country as a whole with the animosities making it difficult. But there's a little bit of a, you know, there but the, for the grace of God go I kind of situation. And some of the C3s are starting to realize, wait a minute. The power can switch. The same yeah. thing would happen. And um, I, I'm just as quick to defend the Tides Foundation, for example, which really is to the left what donors trust is to the right. As far as I'm concerned, we're not competing with each other. Our donors won't be their donors. Our organizations won't be theirs. But God bless them for doing what they're doing. And um, I'm going to support that no matter what. Yeah, I gave a shout out to democracy, which which to me means something more broader than just a way of, right. of, of, of electing your representation. 
It's, it's about um, devolving power, as much power, all the power back to the individual. And, and I used to think that there was sort of a, an American consensus that that would be an okay, good thing. Yeah. Um, but the current debate about free speech gives me pause. Um, we're losing some great civil libertarians, um, actually right and left. Mm-hmm. And, and it doesn't seem... They're that, finding justification for things they should not be finding right. justification and for. And that's, that's a slippery slope. Like yeah. once, once you start saying that speech isn't good, right. um, two years from now, your worst enemy is going to have the, the reins of power. That's right. And they're going to impose that George Will on calls it government us. by condescension. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's actually an important phrase. That man has and a the, way with he's words. He's got a way with words. I, he, but you could put him some Lafroy in him and the words might actually yeah. become more effusive. But, uh, you know... What do, you, what do you think, how is this all going to play out? Because um, it seems to be a clash between um, uh, government that wants to impose more rules. And there's a lot of states that have already basically demanded donor lists and, yeah. and stifled. Yeah, there are actually two cases right now that are intended to specifically challenge the NAACP case. One's in Cal- unsurprisingly, one's California, one's New York. Yeah. And you have uh, a, a certain uh, female senator who may be running for president who was once attorney general of California who did the exact same thing. If you want to do business in California, C4, C3 or whatever, we need your what's called your Schedule B. And that's yeah. actually an important piece. A lot of people don't realize that every nonprofit in the country, every nonprofit already gives the IRS essentially the names of its top donors in a given period, including donors' trust. Now, we can redact that when giving to the public if we so choose. We're not obligated to do that. So what the states have started to say is we want that list. We know we can't ask for your whole list, but that's an actual federal requirement. And they're setting up a federal state issue. And so far, there's been some success in California, but that's just one chipping away. Another great example is if you want to do, uh, if you're a state-based think tank in, in New Mexico and you work with another think tank, now you're actually potentially accused of racketeering because you've got two groups working together. If uh, the state legislature invites you to testify, you've got to give to them your list of who the donors are before you testify. If you produce that voter guide, you have to, you know, so it's all this little chipping away. And so far, there's been moderate success pushing that back. Um, but if that's bubbling up at the state level, it's only going to affect the federal level. And so I, you know, your question about uh, the future, it's, um, if I feel like it's, it's the whack-a-mole problem, um, although I think I'm more concerned with states changing how they behave. I think there's more activity going on at the states right now because the feds are just going to follow through. Um, And that's the concern right now is your local individual citizens not aware of this at all. And part of this is making making folks aware. Yeah. Oddly enough, uh, Camilla Harris is embracing the Alabama argument. um, While she tried to undermine it. No, no irony apparently Mm -mm. um, revealed. Yeah, none at all. Um, Well, now that I'm depressed, but, (laughs) but you know, like. <clears throat> then we drink so, something something important happened here mm-hmm. today and and perhaps a uh, destroying both of our careers we called out both George Washington and mm-hmm. Thomas Jefferson as being corrupted by we the did. power that they warned us against we did um, so even if, if those guys go um, we should perhaps be wary of power corrupting that's a very good way but we are at least intellectually honest yes yeah at least intellectually honest <laughs> thanks thanks a lot cheers man cheers I assumed that I got the signal that we were done. No, I did not signal you that we were done. Oh, really? What time is it? Uh, we have four more minutes to hit 40 minutes. Yeah, I tried, so to, tell you, I tried to tell you 35. Okay. <laughs> so I also tried to tell you keep going. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they call mixed, mixed signals? Close enough, right? Yeah. I, I think it's close enough. Um, you do an advertisement or we could, five, three or minutes. we could pick it up. Also, <clears throat> we, I think we should do a little intro um, just so you were saying, oh, Thanks for watching Kibbe on Liberty. We're here with Lawson Bingham oh. today. I, I do have a subject that, that is sort of a, That's fine. in my craw that I want to confront you with. Okay. Get a little closer. <laughs> Are we still rolling? Get a little closer to your mic. We're keeping all this. And, and, and you'll, oh, this is all in, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we're not done. We're not done. Which is good because. The, we have this. The, uh, I've confronted you with, with the Mother Jones article. Mm-hmm. And, and I feel like you deflected. You didn't really answer the questions I asked. Um, but, but my beef 
with you philanthropy guys. Yep. You don't get enough from, from day one. Yeah. Well, first of all, it, if this is an ATM, where's my card? <laughs> You're doing well so far. I, just I just, for the record. Yeah. Just <laughs> okay. confrontation is a great way to, to raise money. But, mm-hmm. but here's my beef about philanthropy. Um, there is so much focus on, on, on the, um, symptoms of, of poverty. Okay. And I see this all over the world. And you know we, uh, we we try to feed people, and we we try to rescue people, and we we try to um, get children um, vaccinations and things that they need to survive. But I feel like we don't spend enough time trying to answer the question: Why are those things happening? Mm-hmm. Why are there hungry children in all across the world? Why are there lack of opportunities? And to me, philanthropy would spend a little more time actually focused on. Um, how do how do people get rich? I would actually go even a step further in self criticism and say one of the problems we who are in the philanthropic world forget is the importance of business and entrepreneurship, the actual literal wealth creation that may make it possible for philanthropy to sort of start. Yeah. And so you're focused on the aid question and you're not focused on what are the conditions necessary that actually allow individuals to be free and prosperous and pursue things. Now, I would argue that from a selfish standpoint, donors trust, that's why we're so engaged with a lot of the think tank world who are trying to be more creative about what are the conditions necessary? What are the rules of the game so that we see flourishing, not just giving the handout. Uh, and I think a lot of foundations do exactly what you just said. They're, yeah. It's about feeling good. It's about a temporary uh, Band-Aid. The younger generation might be argued as a little more focused on outcomes. Yeah. Fair enough. I actually would encourage that. So um, I, I think you're right. I think some of the younger and newer foundations are trying to look at the next 20 years of how do we actually not just alleviate something, but create a situation where rules have changed trade barriers are down, there's more flourishing. So the philanthropy actually will come from them to other places rather than us just sort of bridging a divide. There's a there's an organization you know well called the Atlas Network. Yes. That has launched a program. I don't think it's that new anymore. They've been working on it for a while. Doing development doing differently. Development differently mm-hmm. um, which, which is sort of challenging people to think about, um, you know, where does, where, where does wealth come from and, and what is the link between wealth and prosperity right. and opportunity right. and all these things. Um, well, uh, it's the same thing of you can teach the man to fish and he can teach others to fish, but what if it's illegal to fish? Right. You've got to change the rules of the game to allow that uh, sort of entrepreneurial spirit. So that certain institutions are going to be good at that and certain ones are not, but that's part of development. My favorite evangelist on the subject is, is Maget Wade. Mm-hmm. She's great. Um, who is, is She's trying. actually going to be in town in a week or so. Want a little. She, she, there you she go. might just be coming mm-hmm. on this show. Mm-hmm. Um, which is going to be weird because I think we're going to show her show before yours. Okay. So now we've revealed so now an, another. Just revealed yeah, it. you okay. just. I was right. going to pretend she had already, okay. already been on the show, but we can't do that. We can't anymore. do that anymore because I've ruined um, it for you. Because you know the tagline for this show is mostly honest conversations <laughs> with mostly interesting people. Okay. Um, I don't, I don't know, know if we've accomplished that today or not. I don't know. We had mostly interesting whiskey. But she is. Uh, she's a rock star, and she's so angry about all of the well-meaning foreign aid that comes right. into Africa. Right. And, and sometimes there, there's unintended consequences that actually potentially make it worse mm-hmm. than if they'd never tried to do that. Uh, we're going we're gonna to try to get Bono mm-hmm. on the show and, and maybe play a second. We know how band. he feels about uh, it. He just yeah. did it again at, uh, you know, in Switzerland, yeah. which is another great example of you know, the business community coming to kiss the hand of government, which is yeah. really what Davos is, yeah. um, which is unfortunate. But um, I'm going to leave you personally with the responsibility of solving this problem because all of this feel-good philanthropy, it, it could do better. Okay. We could do better. I will take that back and talk to the powers that be Excellent. in the dark money ATM. So let's, uh, let's end this conversation a second time. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to like toast and do the mic thing. It is. It's in the way, but... Thank you. Thank right. you for doing this. I realize Thanks you've now exposed me. yourself to all sorts of personal attacks, and I can't wait to read the comments. I, I can imagine, but <laughs> I will happily take them. Yeah. It, finally, someone's mad at you instead of me. <laughs> or Cheers. both of us. Cheers.
Thanks for watching Kibbe on Liberty. By now, you know this is the most important event of your week. So make sure you subscribe on YouTube. Click the little bell so you get notifications. Kibbe on Liberty, mostly honest conversations with mostly interesting people.